Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2024 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of notes from L.A. Leontiev's April 1950 meeting with Stalin regarding the political economy textbook. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So we usually get our texts from the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org. This one is actually from the Wilson Center, digitalarchive.wilsoncenter.org. We recently did some texts that wound up on the Sino-Soviet split playlist regarding Khrushchev-era revisionism in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And there were a lot of questions in the comments about where does revisionism come from? If the USSR and the CPSU were building socialism successfully, how did revisionism manage to get the upper hand, which eventually resulted in the entire destruction of the USSR in a counter-revolution several decades later? And some other people also had questions about what is revisionism generally. So we're going to come back to that in a second, because I think it's important before we start the audiobook. But to introduce the audiobook itself, the reason why we're doing this text, which is very short, is that it contains a number of interesting things, but mainly Stalin's remarks on how they were teaching Marxism in the USSR. For those of you who have listened to the audiobook with comments on Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds, one of the questions that was coming up for me was, what were they teaching people in the USSR where Soviet citizens in the 80s and maybe earlier thought that they could introduce some parts of capitalism without the whole system coming unraveled? In other words, having all this economic security, but then also having, I guess, whatever they thought were the good points of capitalism. In other words, just not really believing that capitalism was that bad, that maybe the communists who led the country were exaggerating the negative effects of capitalism. And then, of course, that happened. And the social devastation that resulted in the 90s was just awful. Life expectancy plummeted. It was one of the biggest setbacks in human development ever. So hearing this from people who were growing up in a country, who had been educated in a country that was supposedly led by communists with strong communist influence throughout the country, how were they getting all these petty bourgeois ideas? Well, so that comes back to what is revisionism? Revisionism is the entry of bourgeois ideas into the communist movement. It's called revisionism because it's revising key, crucial theses of Marxism. So an example of this is the need for social revolution. This is a line pushed by anti-Marxist reformists. That is not a Marxist position that you can just reform your way out of capitalism. This was pushed, for instance, by Edward Bernstein and was attacked heavily by Lenin and also by Rosa Luxemburg, for example, in her work, Reform or Revolution. We have that one on the channel. And if you haven't heard it yet, stop what you're doing. Listen to that. Luxembourg makes the point near the beginning of that work that anytime somebody comes in and tries to disrupt the Marxist movement, they've realized that the easiest way for them to do that is say, hi, I'm a Marxist. They're actually not. And I have some ideas that are going to improve Marxism. They're actually out to completely undermine by revising the foundation and inserting bourgeois ideas instead of proletarian ideas. This has always been a struggle, and it's reflective of the larger class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. That struggle takes place in a number of different arenas, and the ideological arena is one of them. The bourgeoisie tries to have bourgeois ideology, its ideas that support capitalism, stay dominant, and that's why they spend billions of dollars on a day-to-day -day basis in so many different ways trying to promote bourgeois ideas, both in overt and more covert or subtle ways. Simultaneously, as the proletariat becomes class conscious and tries to assert its class interests and form an ideology, which eventually can be used to topple the bourgeoisie and then the proletariat can come out ruling society. Well, the bourgeoisie, in struggle with the proletariat and trying to exploit the proletariat, observes that and then attacks it as needed. So revisionism can either come about from an incorrect understanding of proletarian ideas, it can also come about from deliberate efforts of the bourgeoisie to insert bourgeois ideas under the guise of Marxism. So, in the 20th century socialism that we've seen, we so far have not seen, including in the early 21st century, revolutions in the most advanced imperialist countries. 
Marx predicted that these would happen first, and that from there, many other revolutions would quickly follow. To the extent that there were windows of revolutionary opportunity in the 20th century, that is, in the time up till now, it seems like the proletariat of those countries kind of missed the boat for one reason or another, and there are many different factors involved in that. But bottom line, it hasn't happened yet. Where we have seen revolutions has been more on the periphery of empire and the capitalist system generally. So Russia, for example, lagged far behind England, France, even Germany in its development of capitalism and the abolition of feudalism, which is the preceding mode of production. So keeping in mind that Marx and Engels were publishing the Communist Manifesto in the late 1840s, and it took some time, especially in those days where the mass media was not as developed, for those ideas to spread and really take root. Well, by the time that they had, over the course of several decades, the bourgeoisie was arguably in a pretty strong position in countries like England and France and so on. But in Russia, they were still setting up which is in the 1850 Address to the Communist League, which we have here on the channel, Marx and Engels were writing about how the best way to defeat the bourgeoisie was right after the bourgeois revolution, when the bourgeoisie was setting up their government to replace the feudal government. Then the proletariat should set up a parallel government and then just sabotage and interfere with bourgeois affairs at every turn and then try to out-organize them while the bourgeois order is still in an embryonic or still forming phase. Russia was actually perfectly poised for that in the early 20th century. Lenin was also a very good leader and Marxist theorist, but also just in terms of its historical development, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party was in exactly the right time at exactly the right place. The Russian bourgeoisie was just setting up and the Tsar was overthrown in 1917 as the bourgeoisie was setting up its provisional government. There was also a strong socialist movement and the country had been in the chaos of World War I for several years. It was the perfect window of opportunity and they did pull off the revolution. So this sort of pattern of revolution on the fringes or where capitalism is weakest, well, that makes sense because the relative strength of the proletariat to the capitalists, that exists in a more favorable ratio if the bourgeoisie is not fully entrenched yet. And so we did see other revolutionary movements that were also closely linked with national liberation movements. So again, this kind of bourgeois democratic revolution for national independence, maybe as part of an anti-colonial struggle, where a well-organized class-conscious proletariat with the Marxist-Leninist party was able to take the lead and to direct that movement. But what's one of the weaknesses? Well, if capitalism isn't well-developed in a country, then the proletariat also is not going to be well-developed. That means that politically, it may not be able to stand on its own. It may not have the numbers. So it has to go into alliance with another class, such as the peasantry, which is like a rural petty bourgeoisie, and it has downward social momentum. It is gradually being ruined by capitalism and becoming proletarianized. So in the trend that we know of historical development, the peasantry becomes the proletariat. So the proletariat is its future, and then the proletariat is the future ruling class of all society after capitalism has been abolished, a dictatorship of the proletariat is set up, and class society experiences the beginning of its end as socialist construction begins and the path to full communism and the complete end of class society is embarked upon. But what if the petty bourgeoisie doesn't actually want to give up its petty bourgeois class standing and it retains its petty bourgeois class outlook? Well, that's one of the struggles that you have to face even after a proletarian revolution. So the proletariat could be building a proletarian state in alliance with the peasantry. But the peasantry might struggle against that and try to reassert more of a petty bourgeois or even bourgeois line, politically and ideologically. Well, that's a struggle that you have to face. Remember that the hammer and sickle represents that alliance between the proletariat, the hammer, and the peasantry, the sickle. That's crucial in the early stages when the class composition of a particular country is not such that the proletariat can stand on its own. So like in China, for example, at the time of their revolution, I believe that the class composition of Chinese society was like 1% bourgeoisie, 4% proletariat, and like 95% peasantry. Now compare that with the United States today, for example, which is more than 90% proletarianized. Well, what's the result? You got a big problem in that the petty bourgeoisie is a vacillating class. 
And what to do about that was a big topic of strategic debate within the Russian communist movement, because if that petty bourgeoisie hasn't accepted its proletarian future and the building of socialism, and it wants to hold out for some kind of middle ground agrarian paradise with some kind of small capitalist production dominating on an indefinite basis, you're definitely going to have a problem there because that's going to be a roadblock to the construction of socialism and eventually of communism. Now, that's not to say that that problem can't be overcome. It can through correct struggle, which incorporates a number of different factors from keen strategy to force to just dumb luck. In the end, one line wins out. So, in other words, another source of revisionism can be from the petty bourgeoisie within a revolutionary alliance. So some have described the Khrushchevite phenomenon as a manifestation of this or an example of this, with Khrushchev reviving some specifically Bukharanite or, in some cases, Trotskyite positions regarding the peasantry. So revisionism, again, is not just changing anything about Marxism. It specifically attacks on some of the foundational theses. There was somebody in the comments recently who didn't really understand this, and they were saying, well, you're calling everyone revisionist, but actually Lenin revised Marx. No, Lenin did not do anything that was in contradiction to Marx. What Lenin did was update the scientific socialism that Marx and Engels had laid down for the later historical period of advanced monopoly capitalism or imperialism. So Marxism-Leninism is Marxism in the age of imperialism and proletarian revolution. Its logic does not contradict Marx and Engels' work, it just merely extends it into new conditions of capitalism. So will there be additional new conditions of capitalism? No, because, as the title of Lenin's book says, imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. In my own view, the next time that we would actually need a major update of Marxist-Leninist theory or scientific socialist theory would be maybe uh, for building socialism after capitalism is no longer the dominant force on the planet and something really fundamental changes. In other words, when it's no longer the age of imperialism, which it still is. Revisionism is also not the creative application of Marxism-Leninism in a particular country. So we Marxists are against what we call formalism, which is just mindlessly copying policies or institutions or whatever from one country or one particular national scenario to another without any regard for is this going to fit within the national particularities and whatever other historical peculiarities exist in that situation regarding its specific track of historical development and the confluence of specific influences existing in a particular area. Now, all of those things do follow universal laws, but if you've got, let's say, 10 different major cultural, national, and other particular local features, those are going to exist in different proportions to each other in different places. And so the starting point of the strategy and the initial direction it's going to head out in may be different from one place to the next. So there's creative application of Marxism, but even that creative application always has to obey the universal laws. It can't just start taking out class struggle, for example, or saying that revolution is not needed to end capitalism, and so on. So coming back again to this text and discussing a textbook, there's also the question, when you're building socialism, of what? Human life only exists for a particular duration, let's say 80-ish years, and new people are being born all the time. They've got to be educated into what the system is about. This is the intergenerational propagation of proletarian theory. And if you don't do this correctly, everything can fall apart. So let's pick it up here with Stalin's comments to Leontiev about the political economy textbook that he was asked to review. These are Stalin's comments. I want to make some critical comments about the new draft of the political economy textbook. I read around 100 pages addressing pre-capitalist formation and capitalism. I looked a little at the section on socialism. I'll talk about socialism another time. Today, I want to note some shortcomings related to the sections on capitalism and pre-capitalist formation. The work of the committee has gone along an incorrect path. I said that you should take the first version of the draft as a basis, but you clearly understood that to mean that the textbook was not in need of any major revisions. This is not true. It requires very serious corrections. The first and most important shortcoming of the textbook is the exposure of a complete misunderstanding of Marxism. This is clear from the incorrect description of manufacturing and machine periods of capitalism. 
The section on the manufacturing period of capitalism is blown up. It's given 10 pages, which is more than the machine period. The machine period of capitalism is missing from the textbook. It disappeared. The machine period is not given its own chapter. It is given some pages in the chapter on capital and surplus value. Take Marx's capital. In capital, the manufacturing period of capitalism takes up 28 pages, but the machine period is given a larger chapter of 110 pages. Plus, in other chapters, Marx talks a lot about the machine period of capitalism. Such a Marxist as Lenin, in his work on the development of capitalism in Russia, gave central attention to the machine period. Without machines, there is no capitalism. Machines are the foundation of the revolutionary power that transformed society. The textbook does not show what the machine system is. There's exactly one word about the machine system. Therefore, the whole picture of the development of capitalism is distorted. Manufacturing relied on handicraft and hand labor. The machine replaced handwork. Machine production, this is large-scale production, and the basis of the machine system. You need to keep in mind that our cadres and our young are people who have seven to ten years of education. They're interested in everything. They can look at Marx's capital and at Lenin's work and ask, why is this described differently than in Marx and Lenin? This is the main shortcoming. You need to describe the history of capitalism as Marx and Lenin did. In the textbook, a special chapter on the machine period is necessary, but the chapter on manufacturing should be removed. The second major shortcoming in the textbook comes from the fact that there is no analysis of wages. The major questions are not addressed. The section on pre-monopoly capitalism gives a description of wages along the lines of Marx's description. But wages are not addressed in the conditions of monopoly capitalism. A lot of time has passed since Marx. What are wages? They're the living wage plus some savings. You need to show what the living wage is, the nominal and real wages. Show this decisively. We are in a struggle with capitalism right now on the basis of wages. Take real facts from contemporary life. In France, where the currency is falling, they receive millions, but it's impossible to buy anything. The English declare that they have the highest level of wages and cheap goods, but in doing this, they hide that the wages may be nominally high, but all the same, they don't even make for a living wage, not to mention savings. In England, the prices for some produce, take bread and meat for instance, are low, but the workers receive this produce according to a quota and in restricted amounts. All other produce is bought at the market for high prices. There are multiple prices. Americans boast about their high standard of living, but according to their own statistics, two out of three workers don't make a living wage. All of these capitalist tricks need to be exposed. Using concrete fact, we need to show these same English workers, who have long lived at the cost of super profit in the colonies, that the fall in real wages under capitalism is axiomatic. We can show them that during the civil war in this country, everyone was a millionaire. During the war, we had the lowest prices. Bread was sold for a ruble a kilogram, but produce was fixed. We compute wages in a different way. We need to use concrete facts to show the situation with real wages here. This has large revolutionary and propagandistic significance. It would be right to return to the question of wages in the section on monopoly capitalism and show how it really works. In the textbook, there is a big chapter on primitive accumulation. You can talk about this quickly, in two pages. Here it's told like some kind of duchess drove the peasants off the land. Who will you surprise with that? Things are more significant than an oversight. The epic of imperialism provides more clear facts. About the organization of the book, the section on capitalism should be divided into two sections. Under the letter A, address pre-monopoly capitalism, and under the letter B, address monopoly capitalism. Now on the subject of political economy. In the textbook, there's no definition of the subject of political economy. There's something more like an introduction. There's a difference between a definition of the subject of political economy and an introduction. In this sense, the second version is closer to what's needed, although here we also get an introduction. That explains some of Marx's economic terms. It leads the readers to assimilate the economic work of Marx and Lenin. They write that political economy examines production relations, but this is not clear to everyone. They say that political economy examines the relations between production and exchange. This is not true. Take exchange. In a primitive commune system, there was no exchange. It was also undeveloped during the slave-owning system. The tone is also not right. All of this is also not entirely appropriate for socialism. It needs to be said, political economy looks at production and the distribution of material wealth. This applies to all periods. Production is the relation of people to nature, and distribution is about where the productive wealth goes. This is pure economics. 
In the textbook, there's no transition from the subject of political economy to the primitive commune system. Marx began capital with goods, but you, for some reason, begin with the primitive commune system. You need to explain this. There exist two methods of description. One method is abstract and analytical and begins with general abstract concepts and adds supporting historical material. This method of description, which Marx follows in Capital, is geared towards more educated people. The other method is historical. This describes the historical development of different economic systems and describes it using historical material for a general understanding. If you want people to understand the theory of surplus value, lay out the question from the very birth of surplus value. The historical method is geared toward less educated people. It's more approachable, so that little by little, the reader comes to understand the laws of economic development. And then here, Stalin reads the definitions of the analytical and historical methods. Engels' scheme about savagery and barbarism is used in the textbook. This adds absolutely nothing. It's some kind of nonsense. Here, Engels did not want to split with Morgan, who at that point approached materialism. But this is Engels' issue. What are we involved for? Will they say that we're bad Marxists if we don't approach the problem the way that Engels does? Nothing of the kind. It reads like a pile of garbage. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the tribal system, matriarchy, patriarchy, then savagery and barbarism. This only confuses the readers. Savagery and barbarism, these are disdainful names when viewed from the side of the, quote, civilized. There are many babbling, empty, and unnecessary words, and many historical excursions. I read 100 pages and crossed out 10, and could have crossed out even more. There shouldn't be a single extra word in a textbook. The description should be like a polished sculpture. Then at the end of a section, there are some conclusions attacking imperialists. Yes, you were imperialists. Scoundrels, slave drivers, serfdom. This is all like Komsomol jokes, banners. This takes up time and clutters up people's heads. We should influence people's intelligence. You write that Thomas More and Campanella were individualists and did not interact with the masses. This is simply laughable. Is that what they're about? And if they had interacted with the masses, what would have resulted? That level of the development of productive forces required the existence of inequality. This inequality was impossible to destroy at that time. The utopianists did not know the laws of social development. They present an idealist interpretation. Our cadres need to know Marxist economic theory well. The first, older generation of Bolsheviks was well-grounded. We memorized capital, summarized, argued, and tested one another. This was our strength. This helped us a lot. The second generation was less prepared. People were busy with practical work and construction. They studied Marxism through brochures. The third generation has been raised on pamphlets and newspaper articles. They don't have a deep understanding of Marxism. They must be given food that's easily digestible. The majority of them were raised on quotations, not the study of Marx and Lenin. If things continue this way, people might degenerate. People might decide that they don't need to study Marx's capital when we're building socialism. This threatens degradation. This will mean death. In order to avoid this even in part, it's necessary to raise the level of economic understanding. The current size of the textbook is not right. It swells to 766 pages. We need it to be no more than 500 pages, with around half about the pre-socialist formation and half about socialism. The authors of the first version of the textbook are not concerned with describing the terms Marx uses in Capital. The terms which Marx and Lenin use often need to be brought up at the very beginning so that they may guide the reader toward an understanding of Capital and other works of Marx and Lenin. It is bad that there are no disagreements in the committee and that there are no arguments over theoretical questions. I mean, you're involved in a historic undertaking. Everyone will read this textbook. Soviet power has been around for 33 years, and we don't have a book on political economy. Everyone is waiting. The literary side of the textbook is poorly developed. There's a lot of babbling, many excursions into civil history and the history of culture. This is not a textbook on the history of culture. There should be fewer historical excursions. Turn to them only in those cases when it's necessary to illustrate a theoretical position. Take Marx's Capital and Lenin's The Development of Capitalism and have them guide you in your work. When the textbook is finished, it will be placed before the judgment of public opinion. I have one more comment. The description of capitalism in the textbook only follows the line of industry, but you need to keep in mind the overall economy. In Capital, Marx also concentrated on the question of industry, but we have a different task before us. He needed to expose capitalism and show the curse of capitalism. Marx understood the meaning of economics as a whole. This is clear from the meaning he gave to Kesne's economic table. 
It is not right to describe agricultural issues only in the chapter on land leases. We not only unmasked capitalism, we overthrew it, and we stand in power. We know what kind of weight and meaning agriculture has in the economy. As in Marx, our program of agriculture has not been given sufficient attention. This needs to be corrected. We need to take the laws of economics in their entirety. Don't ignore agrarian relations during capitalism or during socialism. And that is the end of this audiobook. What did you think? Leave questions or comments below, and we will continue the discussion in the comments section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons and Buy Me A Coffee supporters whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. This channel is non-commercial. We don't run ads or sponsorships. It's purely viewer-supported, so if you like this channel, thank me, but also thank the patrons and the Buy Me A Coffee supporters, and consider becoming one yourself. Beyond that, engagement counts. Like, share, subscribe, and leave comments, even if they're just thanks or good video. All of that helps to boost this channel and this video in the algorithm, whether it's on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, Patreon, Substack, or wherever else this can be found. Finally, remember that agitating and educating can be done online, but the third piece of that formula, organizing, happens in real life. Connect with the left in your city, or if you're in a more rural area, maybe your state or region. Network with people, see what struggles are going on, and see ways that you can bring more of a scientific socialist viewpoint to those struggles. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.